My name is uh, Lieutenant Dean Patterson. Um, I'm a lieutenant with the state police in the Mayfield uh, Post. We cover 11 counties, the, the 11 westernmost counties of the state police. I've been with the state police for a little over 20 years, 20, like I said, 21 years, 22 years. Um, and my current assignment is as the investigative lieutenant, uh, which is over obviously the investigations of post, I oversee all those, and then all the administrative functions at post. Years ago, I was in public affairs, which was uh, basically doing presentations like this uh, pretty routinely and going out to schools and civic organizations. And so it's been a bit, but uh, this is kind of where I'm comfortable speaking with groups. First, I want to say I, I was kind of nervous all day because I had a dentist appointment before I came here, and I was afraid that like they're going to have to like find some reason to shoot me up with something in my mouth, and I was going to start drooling everywhere while I was talking to y'all. But luckily, cavity free, everything's good. Um, this presentation is called "Hiding in Plain Sight," and we're going to talk about you know I know the big push was fentanyl, opioids, opiates, and that's that's in this presentation. But I, I kind of want to give a a glimpse of kind of where we were uh, and kind of where we've gone in, in a relatively short amount of time. Um, and I'm sure when you guys think back to when you were in school and in your more youthful age, 20s, 30s, what was uh, illicit drug use then uh, and what's illicit drug use now is completely different. The whole game has changed. And I think the thing that if, I, if you take anything out of this presentation is that all drugs have an inherent danger, we all know that, but drugs are so much more dangerous now across the board because you don't really know what it is that you have. And you shouldn't have them in the first place, but now you really don't know what it is. You, know, you, think, you're, you think you possess one type of drug and it may be something completely different and it's extremely dangerous. So the usual suspects. When I first started working for the state police, working in a patrol function, pulling over cars, going into houses, uh, this is what, if I, especially if I was there in a, looking for drugs or wound up finding drugs, this is a lot what I would find. I would find lots of syringes and paraphernalia for drug usage. Um, you know, marijuana has always kind of been the big one, but it's kind of transformed into methamphetamine. Cocaine's always been around. Heroin was kind of like a unicorn back when I first started. You heard a lot about it, but you didn't ever really find much of it. And then it's, it's made its way back. And we'll talk a little bit about that too. But this was pretty common uh, to find these things. And, and if you found the paraphernalia, you knew that the drugs were close, probably. And what do you think is most dangerous about this? If you were digging around in a drawer or in a car seat, it's getting stuck with one of them needles. So that's what we were always on the lookout for. That was probably the bigger danger for us is, if you've, is, is getting stuck with a needle. And now that's still a very dangerous position to be in, but now the dangers are just so much more broad. Again, marijuana, uh, been around for eons. Uh, and the only thing that's changed is how people smoke it or ingest it. Everything evolves. Uh, if you've never seen one, that's a fully matured marijuana plant. And, uh, you know, when I was little, I didn't know anything about it. I just thought people smoked the whole thing. Well, no, they smoke portions of it. That's where the drug is. So in the bud of the marijuana is where the, the THC is. The THC is what gives people the high. And that right there is basically just they let it dry out, and that's the bud. They don't do it, you know, if you're buying the leaves, you, you've made a horrible mistake. Again, uh, this is what we used to see, and I still see it to a certain extent, but like this is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, a smoking pipe, a, you know, a, a glass pipe that could be used to smoke methamphetamine, uh, crack cocaine, uh, any number of things, uh, rolling papers, uh, prescription drugs. You know, back in the day, prescription drugs, even though you weren't supposed to have them, you knew it probably was a prescription drug. You just didn't know what kind. And now, even if it looks like a prescription drug or a pill, you don't know. And that's what's so dangerous about this. That in there, it's hard to see, but that's like a little shard of methamphetamine. And then here's just another glimpse of kind of what we used to see. That's uh, cocaine. You know, Hollywood's kind of made, glorified the cocaine, and that's what it looked like. That's what you see when you watch TV. Uh, that's meth. 
in the early stages of meth, when they used to cook it a certain way, it was brown and kind of dirty looking. Uh, when, but remember back in the anhydrous, everybody was stealing anhydrous ammonia to make methamphetamine, and everybody was going into the drug stores and buying up all the Sudafed. Uh, when you were making methamphetamine with those types of precursors, you were getting a varied product, and it would always kind of look a little different. And then they started purifying methamphetamine, and that's when they came up with crystal methamphetamine, which is essentially all you really hear about anymore. And most of that is not locally produced. It's usually coming from outside of the country, Mexico mostly. And this here is just any number of types of prescription drugs. Uh, it wouldn't be uncommon for me to open up a pill bottle if I was you know, searching a car or something, and and it could be, it could have 15 different pills in it. Well, you're not supposed to do it in the first place, and I didn't know what kind of pills they were. And you had to hope that the person was telling you the truth, which they didn't always, surprise, surprise, uh, of what was in that pill, or what was in that bottle. But, generally speaking, as long as you wore gloves, you felt fairly safe. And we would field test these things. We had field test kits that we could determine on the spot if it was cocaine or methamphetamine or uh, marijuana was pretty obvious what marijuana was, but you could try to determine what some of these substances were so you knew what to charge or how to package it, things like that. So let's talk about addiction. And there's, I could have a whole other class on addiction and, and why it is what it is. Addiction is basically uh, it, your brain just can't get enough or your body has to have so much of something in order to get by, and that's addiction. And it could be, there's all, sort, there's all forms of addiction. Uh, drugs is just one of, those, one of those many forms. But when you think of somebody who might be addicted to drugs, we all kind of have an idea of what that person might look like. You think? That's kind of a, the FBI would call that a clue. That guy's probably addicted to something, right? But that's kind of, uh, you know, kind of the uh, standard run-of-the-mill look of addiction, but that is not the face of addiction. This, this guy here, he's passed away. Uh, this was a lead singer of the Foo Fighters, a pretty popular band. Uh, you, a lot of times you assume that everybody that's in rock and roll is in drugs, and that is true to a certain extent, but he found himself heavily addicted to opiates and opioids and wind up losing his life because of it. But he didn't look near as bad as that guy. Who remembers who this person is? It's Macaulay Culkin from Home Alone, right? Well, he doesn't, I mean, as a, he's probably, what, eight years old in that movie? He didn't look like he was going to be anybody that was going to be addicted to, to opiates or opioids. And he gets a little older. And let's look at that progression. It doesn't matter who you are. Addiction can take hold of anybody in this room. It doesn't matter how good of a house you were raised in, how bad of a home you were raised in. Addiction, if it, sets, if it gets a, a set, a foot in your life, it doesn't matter who you are, how, you, how you're brought up. Demi Lovato, that was pretty, uh, two or three years ago, she was a, she's a pop star. Uh, she had a, a battle with addiction. Claims to be clean, and I hope she is. But that doesn't look like somebody who would be a drug addict. And then this guy, just a normal standard guy named Gentry. Uh, there's another presentation. I pulled this slide out of it. talks about Gentry's battle with addiction and how he's overcome it. But this guy right here, anybody walking down the street, that's, that's, that's somebody who was addicted to, to, uh, to drugs. So I think for the most part, we used to have, kind of have a prototypical addict. And that's not the case anymore because it's extremely easy to become addicted to drugs. So I'll put this little sentence in here, phrase, innovation isn't limited to good works. I mean, you know, as time goes on, things evolve and things are innovated. And like we have electric cars now and, and we have things that can sit on our countertop that can do the same thing that giant stoves used to do 100 years ago. That's innovation, and it's awesome. It's made our lives easier. Microwaves is a perfect example of, of what innovation has, done to, innovation has done to our lives. But it doesn't stop at the good. It also goes towards the bad. People will use that innovative mind for the wrong purposes. 
not a, I'm not a fan of NFL football per, per se, but uh, does anybody know what that dance move was called? There was a big, uh, for a long time, everybody was, it's called the dab. Everybody was doing this, and uh, there's a big controversy of whether or not dab was a dance that eventually became known for its uh, drug usage. The, like a dab was a, is a type of using, a type of drug use, or did the drug use come first and the dance come because of the drug use? And there's, depending on who you ask, there's a, there's a big debate on that. But I put that on there because for several years, everywhere you went, and still, in some cases, people are doing this all the time. They're dabbing all the time. Well, let me talk to you about dabbing. BHO, uh, I started learning about BHO probably 15 or so years ago when I was in a drug unit. I worked in, uh, in our, the drug investigation side of state police for about three years and, and really got immersed in, into that whole culture. BHO is referred to as butane hash oil or butane honey oil. Now, I talked to you about that marijuana plant earlier and I said, you know, that the whole plant isn't what people are after. They're after the bud, okay, because that's where the drug is. Well, imagine if you take the bud, you imagine you take that one part of the plant and you extract the most potent part out of that plant, okay? Butane honey oil is basically extracting the oil out of a marijuana bud and its, at, its potency is, is off the charts compared to what people used to smoke back in the day. So, in case you can't read this, I'll just read it real quick. It's a new form of smoking weed. Instead of smoking the buds of the marijuana, which is what was typical for the longest time, uh, kids now and adults smoke the oil from it. So they're extracting the most potent part of the marijuana plant and getting it at much higher levels than it was ever intended for, even in recreational use. And the harmful effects, I mean, the effects on, on, the, on the body are just untold, really. Some of the nomenclature, the oil slick is a jar that you put the oil in, and that's what it looks like. It looks like oil. I'll show you a picture in a second. The dabber is the tool that you scrape it out with. The oil rig is like a smoking device or a bong uh, that you would put the oil on, and then there's a thing called the nail, and that's what gets really hot. It heats that oil up, and it allows you to... It basically vaporizes the oil and lets you smoke it. Everybody's in here is familiar with vaping, right? And we're going to talk about vape here in a little bit. There's an example of what the finished product of BHO would look like. What does that look like? If you saw that sitting on someone's nightstand, what would you think that it was? It looks like candy. To me, yeah, it looks like candy or it looks like lip balm, Carmex. It looks like you would just stick your finger in there and rub it on your lips and go out, right? Well, what that is is actually almost pure THC. So I did some research uh, early on leading up to this presentation, and at its highest levels, there's about 25% THC in a marijuana plant or bud. It could be up to 90% in, in this BHO. So imagine what you're getting in just one or two hits out of that. It's, it's completely changing the ball game on how people are ingesting this drug. And this is just marijuana. This is just a marijuana derivative. And so the story I'm trying to tell is how this kind of just ramps up. You know, it started at just marijuana grows naturally and it's become this that's being kind of synthesized to, to do things that nobody ever imagined. These are some other forms of that and different names. And I put these on there because, like, you may hear this. You may, I mean, you may hear grandkids or kids say something about this, and you wonder what it is they're talking about. This, to me, is just as dangerous as anything out there for children because this is, could be what gets them into something else. Or this could be the one thing that they, that they get involved in that, you know, is the end. And if you look at it, it almost looks like food. I mean, it looks like, I mean, they call this one, like, butter. It looks like peanut butter or uh, some sort of candy or there's all sorts, of, and I've got all kinds of pictures that'll show you some of the different forms of, of marijuana here. So right here, I won't read that verbatim, but basically they have determined, and it's easy to see, I mean, I have a 13-year-old in school, and, and she talks about people getting caught vaping in school regularly. Um, it's like smoking in, the, smoking in school back in the day, but now they can, they can hide 
vapes a lot easier than they can hide cigarettes because it just doesn't put off the same kind of odor. And they're finding that between the grades of 6 to 12, it's kind of becoming the prevalent form of drug abuse is, is vaping marijuana oil. And there's not a lot of regulation, and there's no regulation for marijuana if you're in a state that it's illegal, which currently, I mean, it is in Kentucky. You can go across the river and buy it legally in places, but there's not a lot of regulation on marijuana. Nobody's going to determine how much potency your, your butane honey ore or your BHO is supposed to be. So you don't know what it is you're getting. Whereas if you buy a prescription drug, the FDA are the ones that determine what the levels of everything has to be. But you don't know when you're dealing with these things. So vape pens, you see them everywhere. They're just as common as cigarettes. In fact, I think I see more people vaping anymore than I see people smoking. And it originally came about as a way to try to quit smoking. And if you do it the right way, I think it's probably very beneficial because it at least takes the smoke away. But vape pens haven't been around all that long, and, the, uh, and there's untold, we don't even know what the long-term effects are going to be from vaping because what you're doing is you're ingesting oil into your lungs, and after so long, we don't know how it's going to affect you. Juul was a big one popular. What do you think, the, who, what age group do you think these are popular with? Adolescents. Children, adolescents. Because it doesn't look as, uh, as bad as having a cigarette in your hand. You know, it looks like you've got a, some sort of electronic device, which is all that is, an electronic device that you plug in, and it heats up whatever oil you put in there, and you smoke it. Originally, they, were, you know, they had nicotine. That's what you were trying to wean yourself off of a cigarette with. But just like I said, innovation has kind of prevailed, and it's become a, a vessel to smoke very highly potent marijuana. That there looks like something you would buy at a, at a store at the candy counter. You know, you, if you saw it just in a glance, you wouldn't know. But what that is, is that's oil you put in these vape pens and you smoke. Talking about the dabbing, it kind of became so, so popular that it, you know, people walked around with these things and they didn't really know what they were walking around wearing. Uh, this is a, I mean, you could buy that off the shelf. You could buy that off the, the rack at a store. What's that? To me, I'll tell you what that looks, looks like a uh, thumb drive, like you would put in a computer. It looks like the same thing that I've got in here with this presentation, but that's another vape device. So it's becoming hard for us to know what it is that we're finding, but for people that are out there amongst the masses, you really don't know what it is that you're, you, you may be looking right at something and think you know what it is, but you have no clue. Another example of how uh, prevalent that whole dab thing was. A bunch of kids doing it in a group picture, and there's two police officers standing right in the middle of them doing it with them. So it's kind of like, how about we think about what it is we're doing before we do it, right? But that, you know, so one of these kids hears dab, like, oh, dab, that's cool. But which dab are we talking about? Are we talking about the dabbing that we discussed earlier? Marijuana edibles, again, much more potent than um, marijuana back in the day than when you just roll it up and smoke it. Uh, these things are uh, very, uh, are extremely toxic. This is actually just one picture. Those are gummy bears, but those are actually edible, gummy, edible marijuana. It's, it's just infused with THC. This right here is kind of interesting. This four loco, this drink right here, that looks like something that you would, you know, that your kid would want, you know, at the, at the convenience store to take a drink. It looks like a Red Bull or something like that. And what you probably can't see is it says 12% alcohol by volume. Now, your typical beer is like 4 to 5% alcohol by volume. So it's like three times what a beer is. And it's, what do you think they're trying to market that towards? Children. And there's been a big push to make that very obvious when you see those that it says contains alcohol, but look at how much is going on there. You think it's going to be easily seen? So it's up to the store clerk to determine if they're going to sell it to you or not. This up here, that spark, I think that's 12%. Uh, it's, all these things are so much higher than just your typical beer, and they look like an energy drink. And, you know, you go to the five-star, the pockets, and they're going to be just in the next cooler over from 
the non-alcoholic drinks. And that's what's kind of scary. Another form of uh, edible marijuana, this literally looks like candy that my daughter would, would go by. And I wouldn't, know, I wouldn't be able to tell the difference. I would not know. Uh, it looks like those peach rings. Uh, and I don't know the name of that real candy, but that rainbow one looks just like something you'd buy at the store. There's more gummy bears. 250 milligrams of THC. That's a lot of THC. And imagine people just popping it in their mouth, just like popcorn. Another one. 300 milligrams of THC. They look like, uh, oop. They look like uh, jawbreakers to me. And there's a little bit of thing there that says contains THC. Most of the people that buy this know what it is they're buying. The problem is it's the people that are unsuspecting that are getting it from a friend or finding it in a drawer and they're like, ooh, that looks, that looks good, and they take it. It's, there's just so much of it out there now. And there's a huge business behind it too. Here's another one. Everybody like the, the dots candy? Which one do you think is the real dot and which one isn't? You can't tell the difference. And this one, I think this one talked about, there's 100 milligrams of THC per, per dot in there. And I'm going to have to, uh, this isn't funny, but talk about trying to uh, mess people up. So this is all med edible forms of marijuana, but look at like, it looks like a Butterfinger, a Nestle's Crunch, an Oreo, a Kit Kat, a Milky Way, but they change their names a little bit. So like Buddha Finger, Kit Kat, Twixt. I mean, they know what they're doing, and they're trying to get people to maybe buy it unsuspecting, or maybe they think that we're just silly enough to not read what the package says. But they're doing this on purpose to try to make this more mainstream, and they're just so dangerous, and they're not regulated. That's the thing. This is interesting. In Canada, they sell you the kit to make your own. You just like buy your own oil which is unregulated and probably coming from China, and then you can infuse these gummies with your own oil and make your own edible marijuana. How safe do you think that is? And they say, well, you, they, the reason we do this is so you know how much you're putting in there. Well, how do you know what it is you're actually putting in there? That's the problem. It's just, it's crazy that we're actually at this point. This is a really scary one. I remember when they found these, uh, this looks like the kind of the craft uh, chocolate bar suckers that you would buy, like at a craft store, at a restaurant, or at a, you know, a, a candy store, but they're infused with methamphetamine. And a kid that was walking through the house that just saw that and was hungry and wanted a sweet treat, do you think that they would, that would stop them? No. And what do you think, I mean, meth in any form, uh, in any amount is, is harmful, but can you imagine what it would do to a child, especially a young child that really just doesn't know? These are things that I didn't think that we would be, when I first started working this kind of work, I didn't think we'd ever see these types of things. And it's just, it's, it's exploded. These look like tampons, but they're actually shots of alcohol that you can hide. Put them in a regular tampon box and sneak them wherever you want to. Uh, this right here, the cough medicine one of the most manifestly drunk people I ever arrested for DUI was DUI from cough syrup. And it was awful. It was, it was seriously probably one of the worst cases of DUI I've ever arrested myself. And when I searched the car, there was just several, several bottles of NyQuil in the back seat. And I knew there was a time, you know, nowadays to get real NyQuil, you actually have to they scan your license and they want to know how many of them you're buying because used to people would go to like Walmart when you could get it off the shelf, go in the bathroom and drink two or three bottles of it and just get drunk off NyQuil. Do you think that's addiction driven? It could very well be. Sepacol, um, they have different kinds but certain types of Sepacol have a, have a varied level of alcohol in them. That's, it's used to try to suppress your cough, that's what it does. And so people will figure out a way to abuse all these things. I watched a movie the other day where a girl was making uh, 
drug suckers, and she was actually had a big old bag of these dum dums, and she was unwrapping the real ones using the wrapper to wrap up the suckers that she made. And that stuff really, really happens. So, like, I show this to kind of show you it's easy to conceal, it's easy to hide. Uh, you know, when, when, when we're out and about doing our job, I mean, it, it's easy to miss things. And when they make it hard to, to catch, it's even worse. So I show this. That just looks like your typical tennis shoe. And nowadays, I mean, everybody wears shoes like that. But then there's like a little stash compartment in it behind the tongue. You could put a, quite a bit amount of, of, of illegal drugs in that or money or whatever it is you're trying to transport. There's a hat that kind of got the same type of compartment. And I brought some props. I've, I've collected these over the years, and I've found them all before. That's not stuff that I bought just to show you, but uh, Arizona tea. Anybody like these? I don't like them. But you can put whatever you want to in it. So they take the cans, they cut them up, they fill them with some sort of like compound or, or uh, some sort of mud in there, and then they, you can just put the cat right back on it. If I'm searching a car and I see a 12 pack of these, you think I'm going to think anything of it? Absolutely not. This here, I was actually, I've never, I was impressed when I found this one. This looks like a compact disc. This isn't exactly a drug. It's a scale, so you can weigh your drugs when you sell it. So when I'm searching someone's car and I'm going through their CDs, which nobody has CDs anymore, probably not as good a hiding spot now. Who would have thought? But innovation doesn't stop at good works, right? Somebody is trying to figure out another way. And I say this last one for least because I found this in a toolbox. This is a giant nut and bolt, okay? And it works just like a giant nut and bolt. I can take this off and I could probably put something together with it. But somebody was such a good machinist that you take the head off this bolt and you bore it out and you can put anything you want to in there. You can put enough fentanyl in there to kill everybody in this room, probably in the library. And we'll talk about fentanyl here in a second. But that doesn't look like a very big space, but that, depending on what it is you're trying to transport, that could be a lot of money worth and a lot of dangerous drugs. But I'm just, I show this because people will go to any length to try to hide what it is they're trying to get by you. So everybody's going to go back to their, their toolbox and start taking off the heads of their stuff. If it's not real, you'll never get the head off, I promise. All right. So our biggest threat today, and this is, uh, is kind of what was really pushed when they were promoting this presentation, was fentanyl. Uh, fentanyl is an opi opioid. You might know what the difference in an opiate and an opioid is. You hear them interchangeably. So an opiate is natural, morphine, heroin, codeine. They used to, you know, all cough syrups used to have codeine in them. Uh, those, those, those are opiates. Opioids are synthetic or semi-synthetic. So fentanyl is a, is a synthetic opiate, so it's an opioid. Hydrocodone, anything that's made in a lab or, um, you know, isn't naturally occurring through chemistry is an opioid. Fentanyl is one of those. Um, this is the most dangerous thing that we have in our communities right now. The most dangerous thing. I've never seen anything like it. I hope I never see anything worse. So a fentanyl, it was originally used for pain. Morphine. When you think about morphine, I think about anytime I watch like a war movie and somebody gets injured or a casualty, What's the first thing that the medic would come do? He'd stick a morphine in them, right? And a lot of people that went through that when they came home, not by their, not on their fault, they were addicted to morphine because they, were, they had so much injected into them. Fentanyl is 50 to 100 times stronger than morphine, okay? And it first was developed in a patch. When I first learned about fentanyl, when I first started knowing that it existed, it was in a form of fentanyl patches. And so like cancer patients would get them for pain control. But then when it started being abused, people were cutting open the patches and trying to derive the fentanyl out of the patch. But it was still in such small quantities then that we weren't, we weren't seeing the same type of, of uh, 
dangers that we're seeing now. It's diverted for abuse because it's uh, extremely potent and what, what we started seeing was that you could use fentanyl, which was very, very cheap, and cut it with a more expensive drug and, and then you could sell your illegal drug as a very potent drug for much more money because people thought, well, this is, this is a very powerful drug. Uh, fentanyl is, is bad stuff. There's some street names. They change all the time, so I don't worry too much about that. White China or China White was one that they used you know, six, eight years ago, and they still use it today. Um, it gives you an extreme high, but it's short-term, slows your respiration, and that's what eventually kills you. It just, you just, it's, that's what morphine does, too. That's why they drip morphine, and they'll just give it to you all at once. And it produces effects of relaxation, euphoria, pain relief, obviously, sedation, confusion, drowsiness, dizziness, uh, pupillary constriction, and respiratory depression. And once again, it's that respiratory depression uh, is what gets you. Put a few uh, news stories in here, and we start out kind of just all over the country, and then we're going to focus into the home. This tells you how some people, the day that they are brought into this world, don't even have a chance. So these parents were addicted to opiates, and she gave birth to her daughter. This was in Utah. And they heard that, obviously, they would know if the daughter, the doctors would figure out if the daughter was going through drug withdrawals, even as, an, as a newborn. And so they, they saw that if they took some crushed up opiates and rubbed it on the gums of the, of the newborn, that it would mask the withdrawal. It would mask the addiction. Well, they were caught, obviously, because that's not something you can just easily do. But that just tells you, tells you the extreme that people will go to to cover up whatever problem they have because they're so addicted to it. And so I used to be, I used to be when I was younger, I used to be jaded. Like, these people have a choice. And there is a, a point in time in which you have a choice. It's the first choice you make. But there comes a point in time where the choice is where, if you do it now or if you do it later because you have to have it in order just to, to, to get by. This is in Colorado, and this is what we started seeing like five, six years ago. This is when we knew that fentanyl was really coming on because obviously when drugs get trafficked, they come in in large batches. They come to like, you know, it's kind of like the wholesale market. You have somebody that's an upper level dealer, gets theirs from wherever. They bring it to a certain, like they may bring it to a big city and they spread it out to people who are coming from all around and eventually what they brought into the big city winds up in Paducah or winds up in Mayfield or winds up in Benton. Well, in uh, this little town outside of Denver, they found in the same apartment complex, they had five people that were found dead from ODs at the same time. Well, they determined that they all had been purchased or had been a party to the same batch of drugs that were brought into that apartment complex. And they found out that there were actually several places within that whole area that, uh, that had the same, what they considered to be the same batch of, of illegal drugs, and they assumed that it's because it came from the same place and it was eventually uh, you know, brought out throughout, uh, throughout town. And that's the exact same thing that happens now. This wasn't in the presentation originally, but I remembered it and I found it and I wanted to put it in here. So this was in West Virginia, so we're getting closer to home, right? Now, if you, if you do a lot of studying about opiates, that problem kind of started in Appalachia. And it started because there was a lot of people that were getting hurt on the coal mines, big, big labor work, and they were getting injured and they were getting prescribed OxyContin for the pain and they wound up getting addicted, and that's where Appalachia kind of became the center of all this. Well, West Virginia, right in the heart of Appalachia, from 3 to 8 p.m. on a specific day, they, uh, they had several people, they had, I think they said eight, I can't read it here, several calls of an overdose in the same, in the same town, and they found out it within a 53-hour period, uh, they had over 20 overdoses in that, in that same town. It's the same thing. So that's what I'm talking about with Colorado, the same problem. It comes in, it gets sold or distributed, and then you can almost tell immediately if, if that was a bad batch, if there's even such a thing, uh, because people start immediately feeling the effects of it. 
Getting a little closer to home, Louisville. Six-year-old died in an apartment from ingesting uh, fentanyl. So he goes back to a kid walking around the house, pilfering around, finds something that he thinks looks good, looks like a toy or looks like candy. Next thing you know, he's six-year-old, and it doesn't take much. And I'm going to show you how little it takes to uh, have a lethal dose of fentanyl. Get a little closer to home, even. This talks about our region right here. McCracken County, in 2016 anyway, they led the area in, uh, in overdose deaths. That's total deaths. Marshall County had the highest, num had the highest number oops, had the highest number of deaths per capita, so based upon their population and their deaths, they actually took the, took the high one there. And as you would kind of expect, Louisville had the most overall deaths either way, for per capita or overall. But that just tells you that it, it finally made its way here. When heroin started showing up, it was like a big, slow wave that started in New York City and the East Coast, and it slowly made its way to Kentucky. And it hit Eastern Kentucky. It was, it was weird because I could talk to troopers in Eastern Kentucky that would tell me how bad it was, and we hadn't even seen it yet. That's how slow of a roll it was. And it slowly made its way. It just crept in because all that distribution network finally crept into Western Kentucky. And that was heroin when heroin started popping back up again. And now heroin, although it's a still a big concern, fentanyl is the biggest concern. I remember when this happened, a, uh, I was working in the drug section at the time, and a, a young man overdosed and died in Marshall County, and the federal uh, prosecutor charged him with his death because he was the one that sold him the drugs. And that used to be something completely unheard of. Like if you sold all the drug dealers, if you charged all the drug dealers with the ODs of their, of their uh, customers, you'd be charging a whole lot of people. This was the first time that we'd seen him actually go after the, the dealer. And I think, you know, it, it, it made an impact. I think people saw that we were serious about this, but it's still happening today. So I showed this earlier, but that's, that's the difference. Fentanyl's synthetic, like I said, it's 50 times stronger than heroin, 100 times stronger than morphine. And to give you an idea, so there's different types of fentanyls. There's, uh, it's basically what they call uh, uh, the byproducts bi of fentanyl. Lethal dose, two milligrams. So if you think about a, and I didn't bring, I meant to bring one, a, uh, a sweet and low packet. That's about a gram of sweet and low, or a gram of equal, or a gram of whatever. Which means there's 500 lethal doses of fentanyl in a, in a gram, in a packet. So there's not 500 people in this building. So imagine, once again, how much you could put in this thing. The problem with that is you can't always see it, and when you, the problem I have right now, or what I'm trying to get my troopers to understand is you can't just run into a house or a car and just start looking at stuff and throwing stuff around because that stuff starts getting airborne. That's, what, that's, why, that's how people get accidentally exposed, and we've seen police officers get accidentally exposed a lot just from routine searches. Gloves aren't going to save you. Car fentanyl. Is an analog, it's basically another version of fentanyl, it's just that they've changed the chemistry a little bit. To give you, kind of give you a perspective, car fentanyl is used as an elephant tranquilizer. And the same amount of car fentanyl to tranquilize an elephant would do the same to that many humans. And people are using it as a recreational drug. And you almost have to show things that are just that outlandish to be like, wow, it's, I can't believe it's, it's really that bad. The DEA in San Diego in 2019, uh, they started learning about fentanyl using vape pens. So that's kind of like you think you know how to combat one problem and then all of a sudden they found out another way to use it. And now they're vaping it. And what's the most, I guess, what's most scary about it is that people are vaping stuff that they think they know what it is, they think they're vaping maybe the CBD oil, or they think they're vaping, whatever it is they bought, which is unregulated, but it might have fentanyl in it. It may have been in the contact of fentanyl and they didn't know it. And one hit and that's it, you're done. That's what's so scary about this drug. Uh, and most of the people 
And I'll, I'll be honest, I got a friend who, who lost a daughter from an o overdose, and she went to purchase, uh, I forgot what the pill was, but she went to purchase a pill to help her stay awake to study for finals. Shouldn't have done that, she shouldn't have done that. I, I don't know what it was, but uh, we know what happens. She thought she was getting whatever it was she set out to buy. What she didn't know was that had fentanyl in it, and she died. I don't know, I mean, that's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. The, the smallest uh, amount of damage, but that right there is like, you know, she, yeah, she shouldn't have been doing that in the first place, but that used to not be it, that used to not be an issue, and now people just don't know what it is they're having. Here's another one, a 39-year-old man dies from vaping liquid fentanyl. It's just, a, it's crazy that people try this, uh, and maybe they just haven't listened, maybe they're so addicted it doesn't matter, but uh, that's why we're here today to talk about it. Scary stuff. A quick story about this picture here. This wasn't the exact picture of what we had purchased. So when I was in the drug section, one of, well, our main goal was to find drug dealers or find people that could buy from drug dealers and we would covertly purchase drugs from people. And most of the time we were buying marijuana or meth and occasionally we would buy prescription, you know, diverted prescription medications. So like somebody that uh, is doctor shopping, collects a bunch of oxycodones, and then they'll sell them for so much a pill. And so we had set up a purchase of, a, of a, I think it was like 10 oxycodones or oxycontins. Can't remember which one. And we made, we, we made the purchase. We sent our guy in. He bought them. We brought them back. We looked at them. We put the cat back on the pill. We packaged them up. We sent them to the lab because that's what we do. We inspect it, make sure that we got what we paid for, and then we send it to the lab. They looked like Oxycontins, they were stamped like Oxycontins. If you, if you got on the drug reference and put in the special code that's on the pill, it came back as an Oxycontin. Pure fentanyl. It was a pressed fentanyl pill. We had no idea. Luckily we didn't reach in there and grab them and really look at them. That's when I realized this is not anything that I want to get close to. And I started telling my guys, I said, we're not going to field test drugs anymore. I said, if we think we know what it is, we're going to write down that's what we think it is, we're going to send it to a lab and let them tell us because they're the ones that are equipped to not get exposed to this stuff. But that right there, that's, that's fentanyl in, <clears throat> in pressed pill form. That looks like sweet tarts to me. It would look more like sweet tarts if it didn't have those markings on. But people go out of their way to mark things up to make them look like the real thing. That again is why it's so dangerous. So let's talk about overdoses. Overdoses, I mean, we hear about it all the time, but like, it's hard to put it in perspective. Like, you know, it probably don't have to go too far down your, your friend tree, your family tree to know somebody who's been uh, either overdosed or know somebody that did. So just under, or just over 58,000 names on the Vietnam Memorial Wall. Anybody here a veteran? Thank you for your service, guys. I really do appreciate that. Lots of names on that wall. And that Vietnam War went on for a while, didn't it? In one year, almost double died from an overdose across the country. And that's a pretty new statistic. I venture to say it's higher now because, I mean, the problem hasn't gotten better. If anything, it's gotten worse. Let's talk about Kentucky because a lot of times it's easy to say, well, you know, it's we're safe here, and we're safer here than a lot of places, but we're not safe. 2015, uh, that was the year I went into the drug section, and that's, you know, we knew that there was problems, uh, but it wasn't quite as bad as it was going to get. Went up in 1386, but if you'll notice, look at the, look at the, uh, what the drug was. So heroin, pure heroin was 34% of the overdoses. These are overdose deaths, by the way. Fentanyl and heroin mixture, 47%. In 2017, look what's kind of starting to overtake. The overwhelming majority is becoming fentanyl at 52%. It, it goes up, heroin goes down. It's hard, it's hard to produce heroin. You have to have poppies to make heroin. Poppies are only grown in certain parts of the country. Fentanyl is made in a lab 
Now, you hear a lot, it's like it's coming from Mexico. It's, a lot of it's being manufactured in Mexico. The components to make it, are a lot of it's, most of it's coming from China. And why do they think they bring it to Mexico? Because they, it just flows right in from the southern border. And I'm not trying to be political, but that's just the truth. 2019, it kind of took a dip, if you notice there, and I don't know why. They started pushing legislation, uh, but I'll be the first to say that just because you legislate does, something doesn't mean it's going to solve the problem. But then it starts to, to track back up. Fentanyl's still up there. Acetyl fentanyl is just a, an analog. A fentanyl is just another version. 2020, 71% of the fentanyl of the overdose. Do you think all those people knew that's what they were taking? I venture to say that most of them didn't. Most of them thought they were probably getting high on something else, but it was fentanyl that they were actually using. 2021, 2,250, and it takes sometimes, sometimes, especially too early in the year, because anything that happened in later December, it takes a while for those results to come back, so I don't have 2022. But there's kind of a snapshot. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. I think about the high school I went to. We had about 1,300 people in it. That's a big high school. Imagine just every year you're losing that many people. Here's what they saw in their, uh, this is in 2021. This is what they saw in their toxicology. No surprise, most of it's fentanyl. That 4-ANPP is another analog of fentanyl. Uh, the parafluorofentanyl. fentanyl, that's another one. Uh, but if you look down here, like in 2000, the big problem was oxycodone. I remember when I was like a senior in high school, fresh out of high school, I was about 2000. Everything was oxycodone. I remember being in Lexington. Uh, for a basketball game, we were in a hotel, and the police came in to the hotel, and they were asking everybody if you had oxycodone. I'm like, I don't even know what oxycodone is. That's a big deal back then, but look, it made the bottom of the list. We're way up here with fentanyl, and it's only getting worse. So, timing is perfect. We talk about addiction. We talk about whose fault is it. Is it the user? Is it the supplier? You know, it's, it's about the decisions that we make first off. Uh, and sometimes that first wrong decision, you're, locked, you're in. And it's hard to, to claw back out of it. So I think it was in 2016, you know, everybody's trying to figure out how do we fix this? How do we fix this? And for the longest time, uh, and even today to a certain extent, I mean, law enforcement's role in this is to, if you find somebody that is an addict and they have dope on them, you arrest them, you put them in jail, they try to get them in rehab, maybe they, maybe they get there, maybe they don't, maybe they don't have insurance to, to afford rehab, all sorts of problems. So we thought, well, there's got to be another way to try to help these people. And so they started a thing called the Angel Initiative, and we actually started it in our post early on. And what that is, this is, a, and I meant to bring the actual brochures, but I forgot them. And it's not hard to read. I'll just kind of explain what it is. The Angel Initiative allows people who are addicted to anything, uh, drugs, alcohol, uh, no matter what kind of drug it is, as long as they're not under the influence when they show up, and as long as they don't have a warrant, they can show up to our office, even if they have the drugs on them. They can forfeit the drugs, we won't charge them, we lock them up in evidence, and we try to place them in some sort of treatment, whether it be like Four Rivers, there's all sorts of different places. And you can only imagine early on, people didn't really trust us, right? They're like, there's a catch, right? And I had to admit, it's like, we're really going to do that? Like, we're really going to let them walk in here and just like into their pockets and we're just going to take them to a rehab facility? Well, that's what we do. And we just had one like last week. And sometimes it's hard. To, the problem is it's hard for us to find beds. And I think if you talk about the, the treatment it, options, it's finding, finding places for people to go into treatment. And do you think it's free? No, because the first thing they ask, well, do they have insurance? Well, most people have some form of insurance, and these places are very, very good about even the lowest forms. They'll get you in. So we feel like that's the least that we can do. You know, maybe that's the first time that anybody's offered to help them. I don't know. And if they feel like they can get help from what at many times was probably their adversary in law enforcement, maybe they feel like they can open up and get help from other people too. So we've been doing that for about five years now. It's not going away. McCracken County has uh, a similar program. I can't remember what it's called, but they do the same thing. And a lot of it, and we got ours from another state that was doing it. So 
uh, I think we're going to start seeing more and more of these. And uh, there can't be any negative outcome from that. The worst thing that can happen is they check themselves out. And, they sh and we have had people that are repeat customers. And we don't turn them away as long as they're not wanted. But it's at all the posts. You can go to any post and get it. All right, guys, I appreciate it. You guys have been great, and uh, maybe I'll come back again soon. Thank you so much.